Hello. Today we are talking with Dr. Emily Sandoz. Emily is the graduate coordinator for the Masters of Psychology department or program in the psych department. She is also the Emma Louise LeBlanc Bougers Endowed Professor of Social Sciences and associate editor of both the Journal of Contextual Behavioral Science and Frontiers in Psychology. Good morning, uh, Emily. How are you today? Good morning. Thank you so much. Doing pretty well. Doing pretty well. Well, today we'd like to um, talk to you a little bit about who you are and where you are from. Um, so well, let's start with, uh, tell us a little bit about your education and your mentors. Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think my journey in psychology really started at, um, at UL. Of course, I'd taken a little bit of psychology in high school, enough to know that that might be interesting to me, um, but it was the major I chose. And um, for me, over the years, there were a, a number of folks who, um, who influenced me. So, of course, you were one of my undergraduate professors, Dr. McIvers. Um, and, you know, what I found in psychology was I was really trying, having trouble kind of uh, finding my feet, um, you know, finding what the theoretical orientation was going to be for me that helped me to sort of make sense of, of human behavior. Um, I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Greenway, um, who, you know, we lost a few years ago, um, really just tirelessly harassing me about behaviorism. Um, and then um, Dr. Perkins, who took a softer, uh, those who know him will, uh, will recognize this, took a, a softer, gentler view of sort of pointing me gently in that, um, in that direction. So, you know, they oriented me towards uh, behavior behavior analysis, acceptance and commitment therapy, and actually were the primary influences in uh, me selecting, you know, where I wanted to apply to go to, um, to for doctoral training. I um, applied a couple years in a row. I was not one of those people who applies the first time and was immediately successful. Um, but during that process, you know, I was learning more about behaviorism, about behavior analysis. And that last year that I applied, I applied to all the colleagues of Dr. Perkins and Dr. Greenway who did ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy um, and Contextual Behavioral Science. Um, I ended up work, uh, going to Ole Miss, um, so University of Mississippi in Oxford, Mississippi, and uh, working with Dr. Kelly Wilson, who was my primary mentor there. Um, and then on the other end, I uh, ended up coming home. So, you know, at the end of clinical psychology, we do um, internship search. So we apply to a bunch of different places. There's a match process. And I landed at the New Orleans VA. Um, so there I got the opportunity to really do that final bit of clinical training um, that was part of my degree and worked with folks like Dr. Uh, Leslie Richardson and Michelle Hamilton and Julie Arsenault. Um, and so those were some of my clinical mentors and uh, finally got to land back here, uh, surprisingly enough. And we are lucky to have you. Oh, thank you so, um, much. so when did you land back here, become part of the psychology department? Yeah, so I was actually on internship um, in 2010, yeah, 2009, 2010. So during that academic year. Um, and in fall 2009, I got a Facebook message of all things um, from Dr. Perkins saying, it seems like you've been gone about five years or so. Um, Dr. Wozencraft was making a lateral move into administration to start the first year uh, program. And um, they were looking for somebody to come in as a new professor. So um, in 2010, the day after Mardi Gras, um, you know, <laughs> Ash Wednesday, <laughs> I drove over, I just happened to, to still have a, a day and I drove over from the New Orleans VA and um, came here and interviewed um, and found myself just um, absolutely yearning to, to return. I didn't know what it was gonna be like to interview with all my old you know, mentors from undergrad, um, but it was, it was really, really lovely and it was an opportunity to come home. So I started back in August, 2010 um, as an assistant professor. Wow. Um, and you just recently made full professor, I believe. I did, yeah. Amazing. So that was really exciting. Uh, 10 years, it's hard to believe. This is my 11th year. Um, so I know you have taught many courses, but what do you typically teach now? 
Yeah. So the courses I'm teaching now um, are actually a great representation of what I do. I'm, I'm lucky enough. And I, you know, I think our department head is great at that kind of putting us with the, the courses that re reflect our expertise and our interests. Um, so right now at the undergraduate level, I teach a clinical and counseling course. Um, I share that course with Dr. Wozencraft and um, with Dr. McDermott. So we alternate uh, who gets to teach that. Um, I also teach um, Psychology 370, the behavior modification. That was a new addition um, to my schedule. So finally, um, yeah, right. I, you know, something I've been wanting for a long time. So felt really, really excited to, to add that um, to my courses. Um, at the graduate level, I do our first kind of introduction to research. So our, our thesis prep class, I think I inherited that one um, from you. You um, did. Really <laughs> launching the, the students, you know, getting them thinking about research long before they might have a specific idea or even a specific mentor, um, you know, in mind. So, so getting them started on that and pushing them through that first process of, of picking an idea, picking a chair and all that. Um, I'm also lucky enough to teach our pre-practicum course and then some of our practicum classes. I share that with Dr. Wozencraft. So that's where we train the students in some basic, for pre-practicum, some basic clinical skills, um, you know, how to sit with humans. It's kind of one of the ways that I, uh, that I cast it. Um, and then they, our students get the opportunity to go out and do field practica. So to actually provide psychological services um, in our community is really important for our students because a lot of them are in discernment. You know, do I want to do clinical? Do I want to do experimental? So this gives them an opportunity in a, a protected, um, you know, pretty dense training environment with lots of mentors, lots of support to try on that clinical perspective. Um, and then every other um, every other year, rather, uh, every other fall, I get to teach our um, graduate level behavior analysis class. Um, so that's super exciting for me as well. Of course, uh, it's right up your, your alley of what you will want to do. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell us a little bit about your research. I know that there's a framework that guides you, obviously, behaviorism. You've been talking about that. Yeah. But what kind of research are you doing? Sure. So, you know, um, there's a, a couple of different aspects of the research that I'd like to talk about. Like you mentioned, behaviorism as the as the perspective and kind of the flavor of behaviorism, um, the, the um, area of behaviorism that I'm in is contextual behavioral science or a contextual perspective. And it's not uh, philosophically different necessarily from behaviorism, um, from the classic kind of behaviorism, but it is distinct from some of the methodological behaviorism. So, you know, for us from a contextual perspective. It's just what um, one of my colleagues calls the circumstances view of behavior. What we are interested in is the way that people's history of learning or their history of interaction with the environment interacts with the immediate circumstances to pull, you know, for certain behaviors, to make certain behaviors more or less likely. Um, this perspective is such a, a big leap for a lot of people. You know, we're so used to putting causes kind of in inside of the human why did the person do that? It was, you know, the way their way of thinking or their personality or their, you know, their attachment style. And those are all things that I'm interested in and that my students are interested in. But for us, those are the things that we're trying to predict. <laughs> those are our dependent variables. Those, those are all ways of talking about behavior. So what the contextual perspective does is sort of sort of assign roles um, and say, you know, behavior is always going to be our dependent variable and um, aspects of context are always going to be our independent variables. And so when we see, you know, something that looks like what we would call an attachment issue or a psychological disorder, you know, or a thinking pattern, we're interested in determining what kinds of um, immediate and historical context might predict that. Another way that I talk about it is, um, you know, what resources or lack of resources contribute to those behaviors. Um, and so what that means is a lot of times when students come in, you know, to, that are interested in doing research, rather than our research kind of being held together by a particular phenomenon of interest, like we're not an anxiety lab, we're not a social justice lab, we're not a, um, you know, a sexual violence or a body image lab, we're a contextual behavioral science lab. 
So I have students that do research on all of those things, you know, on body image or our social justice issues, um, affirmative sexual consent, uh, privilege, um, on things like music, on things like, you know, how we follow rules. But all of those phenomena, what, what makes our research hang together is that we um, all share that same contextual perspective. So it's really exciting. It's challenging in some ways because we're always kind of confronting new literatures. The, the exciting part is bringing to bear that contextual perspective on those new literatures. Um, we do, I think if there's any phenomenon that is sort of highly uh, reflected or represented in our work, it's it overlaps with my clinical interest in acceptance and commitment therapy. The way that we think about wellness and acceptance and commitment therapy is psychological flexibility. So for the most part, my lab is interested in how it is that people can come to interact with their environment in a way that either produces inflexibility, uh, a narrow and rigid repertoire that's about running away from stuff, <laughs> um, or psychological flexibility, you know, a broad and, and uh, flexible repertoire that's really about leaning towards or moving towards stuff. So in all of those domains, usually to some extent, some aspect of flexibility as a, a general value that we have for, for human experience um, typically comes into play. Excellent. Um, and is there a particular study that you want to talk about today um, that's yeah. going on? I know you've written a book about body image. I, I, I know that. I've read that. It was a wonderful book. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You know, the thing that I'm most proud of right now, I think um, there's a, a couple of things. The things that I'm, the thing that I'm most proud of right now um, is actual, actually a conceptual paper. Um, so we have been working in my lab on some kind of way to approach collaborative writing. A lot of times some students get the opportunity to publish, you know, some students happen to hit the timing right and end up getting on a chapter or an advanced student's paper or an alumni's paper. But for a lot of students, historically, our program is so packed that it's really hard for them to get publication experience while they're in the program in a way that they have real ownership ownership of. So we've been playing with really, you know, inspired, I think, by the pandemic and spending a lot of time co-working. We've been playing with a model of collaborative writing. And recently we um, began discussing affirmative sexual consent, typically conceptualized as yes means yes. And so our paper is called Beyond Yes Means Yes. And it's a behavioral conceptualization of affirmative sexual consent. Um, and what we propose, basically we go through the history of this idea of affirmative sexual consent. Um, we point to the current models and, and how those have worked. And we point to a need to really get behind the form of it, you know, in advocacy, yes means yes, which of course people find limited. You know, there's certain relationships where you might not be saying the words yes, or sometimes a conversation might even sound like a yes. And if you're paying attention to the rest of the behavioral stream, it's clearly a no. And of course, these are really high stakes conversations. So we propose a contextual behavioral model for how to conceptualize and, and actually intervene to build affirmative sexual consent repertoires. This is particularly important, um, you know, well, not just for sort of typically developing populations like college campuses where affirmative sexual consent has become, you know, a big issue, um, but also for many of my colleagues that work with individuals with disabilities, um, you know, with long term developmental difficulties who, mm -hmm. who, you know, really get trained to comply, to be easy for other people. And, and it's kind of a side effect of teaching people to be able to be in school or be in a community. Um, what we found when we looked at the literature is there's just not a lot about how to have conversations about sexual needs, about sexual interests. Um, and so we've made a tiny conceptual contribution to the literature. Um, it was a great experience. We had, um, I think, something like 20 authors, and everybody had a very specific substantive role. Um, and so really, more than anything, I'm proud of the process of us coming together and really contributing in ways that were reflective of 
the unique things that we had to offer. Um, and also the, the idea that, you know, conceptual work is, is an important part of science. Um, it's a part that, you know, what we hope at least is that that paper will inspire some practitioners to incorporate some of this work around sexual consent into their programming that they're already doing in schools or individual work, um, for example, with children with autism. Um, you know, we also hope um, that researchers who have access to um, you know, big databases or, um, you know, everyday learning labs or who are researching programming on college campuses, that they might be inspired and put some of this into a practical investigation. So that's the, probably the piece of work that I'm most proud of um, from this recent history. Thank you for asking. I'm happy to do that. Uh, and the last question that I have been asking the professors, of course, is how might individuals join your lab? Yeah, so we have a very open door, um, you know, sort of policy. So folks can reach out to me and I'll send them some information about the lab and things to read about, about contextual behavioral science and, and basically invite them to come to the next meeting. Um, you know, I warn people, it's not for everybody. It kind of feels like a weird combination of like attending somebody's Thanksgiving with their family and like walking into a 400 level class, you know, walking into an advanced course or graduate level course. There's, um, there's a lot of intimacy, a lot of support. Um, it's also quite challenging intellectually. Um, oh, yeah. And we are happy to invite you know, anybody to come and join. And that's on Fridays from 1.30 to 4. So it's a, a heck of a, a stretch <laughs> um, to do all of that stuff. We, we check in, um, then we pick some con concept that's not typically dealt with in behaviorism, um, that's kind of been ignored by behaviorism. We unpack it conceptually, um, and then we uh, do some clinical practice. So it's a diverse meeting. People can kind of come and go as they please. Um, and one of the things that the pandemic really allowed us to do is to open the lab to remote members. So we have folks from Paraguay and folks from Peru and folks from India and Ireland. And um, it's a very diverse group. We just picked up a couple of MDs from Turkey um, who are interested in getting some research experience um, and kind of being part of a research community. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting group. It's an exciting group. And if people are interested, I really suggest to just come and try it on and see if it feels like a good fit, see if it feels like a place where they could could thrive. So I'm guessing you're never going back to in-person lab meetings. You're going to stay on, on the Zooms. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because some of the people who live here in Lafayette have been like really missing some of our in-person lab activities. And I've been challenging us to let's think about how to create them in a way that's not exclusive to our remote members. So we will almost certainly stay online. Um, we have for a long time had a remote component. Um, a lot of our graduates, um, alumni, you know, in their scary doc programs really like to kind of continue to be involved and have that supportive environment and be able to continue mentoring students. They're, they're the lowest man on the totem pole here in my lab. You know, they're able to do a lot of mentorship. Um, so we have always had that kind of remote component, but yeah, I think we're going to stay, we're going to stay on Zoom um, going forward as, as long as it feels workable. So thanks for asking. I completely understand. Well, thank you so much for talking about your uh, program and your experiences. It's been lovely talking with you. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate welcome. it. Welcome.